When producer Sidney Newman envisioned Pathfinders in Space in 1960, he wanted to use television drama not just to entertain children, but infuse them about science and engineering. Fifteen years later, NBC executive George Heinemann had similar lofty intentions when he approached Jerry Anderson to create a 45-minute TV film to illustrate Albert Einstein's theory of relativity. Speaking to Starlog magazine in 1979, Heinemann said, When the teacher wrote E equals MC squared on the board, I wanted the young viewer to recall that program and say, Yeah, I saw a program about that. I want to learn more about it. Instead of, it's just one more thing I have to memorise and what good is it going to do me? But Anderson and writer Johnny Byrne hoped for more. Could they break North America with an ongoing sci-fi series? Could they take the audience with them into infinity? Welcome back to Very British Futures. I'm Gareth Preston and strapping herself into position at the console next to me, I am delighted to welcome Felicia Baxter, writer, entrepreneur and host of the podcast Tinfro is Reading, who amongst her many accomplishments was a NASA intern. Hello, how are you doing? I'm doing great, um, Gareth. Um, It's so funny that uh, you mentioned me being a NASA intern and how that actually plays into my fascination, has played into, and it continues to play into my fascination with sci-fi. Not so much conflict-driven, but uh, more of the Trekkie, Star Wars, wannabe Jedi, citizen, armchair scientist kind of thing in, into my adult life. That is what basically spawned my true interest. The Day After Tomorrow was commissioned as part of NBC's new 1975 anthology series for young people called Special Treat. It was a mixture of documentaries and one-off dramas with an educational remit. Special Treat would ultimately go on for nine seasons. Jerry Anderson had just finished the first season of Space 1999, which had been syndicated in the USA and was waiting for confirmation of a renewal, which was by no means certain. So naturally, he intended that this one-off production should act as a backdoor pilot for another potential TV series. Consequently, he and Johnny Byrne, a regular writer of Space 1999, added the subtitle Into Infinity and ended the film on the promise of further adventures. There were many other shared elements with Space 1999. The design of the Altares was inspired by the design bible of that series, whilst its interior was largely recycled from the Ultra Probe set, built for the episode Dragon's Domain. The space station, seen at the start, was a modified model which had first been seen in Mission of the Dorians. Meanwhile, the three main actors had all appeared in Space 1999, Nick Tate was series regular Alan Carter, whilst Brian Blessed and Joanna Dunham had both guest starred. Another Anderson regular, Ed Bishop, provided the narration. Faster than light spacecraft, the Altares, crewed by Captain Harry Masters and his daughter Jane, and Doctors Tom and Anna Bowen and their son David, launches on a mission to the Alpha Centauri star system to deploy navigation satellites for future colonists. Afterwards, the families vote to continue their voyage into deeper space, but a freak accident sends the Altares accelerating out of control. Even after they manage to stop, the ship is threatened, first by a supernova and then a black hole. 
The Day After Tomorrow was broadcast on the 9th of December 1975 on NBC and the 11th of December 1976 on BBC One. It has since been released on DVD in 2015 as part of The Lost Worlds of Jerry Anderson and can currently be watched on ITVX. I'm very grateful you've spared some time to have a talk about The Day After Tomorrow. So what did you think of it overall? Overall, I had to, and I gladly suspended my disbelief because I knew this particular production, 1975, 1976, it was not going to have the same feel as what I'm used to now in 2023. But it was refreshing to see this production, which came out only a few couple of years before Star Wars, the first iteration dropped. Um, And by this time, Star Trek had become a legend, you know, in its own right. I thought the modeling was great. The acting, but it was 1975, was a little (laughs) bit overdone for whatever reason. But the idea of this two groups of scientists um, not only deploying satellites, now we're going into deeper space with no 3D printers and true space shields and the communications, not knowing if they were going to come back was so dope. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a a good, fun, well self-contained series. I think, uh, and I would have been interested to see where it could have gone as a series. I wonder if it could have kept the scientific rigor going, if it had under the pressure of producing a whole series. I, I suspect that more sort of Flash gordon fantasy elements might have crept in. No, I think it would have taken on the advances like Star Trek did. A lot of the things that actually started out in the sci-fi realm became um, somewhat of what fueled NASA and the commercialization of space. That's how we're they're able to sustain now. That's how NASA is sustaining now with the launching of the so the satellites, communications, uh, getting faster, uh, not just faster Wi-Fi, but broadband to all of these people. That is how the Elon Musk have and the reuse and the blue origins, those things to use for the space race or for the space is what they were doing in 1975. And they could have utilized, if they had the correct consultants, if they would have utilized the money to actually get those. And as I said, this is, was a time, the golden age of space travel and, and um, exploration in the real world. They could have had the right consultants and they could have built upon those concepts. They talked about supernovas and going into deep space. They could have waited for Hubble <laughs> to start sending back the images and getting those artist renditions and getting there these modelers that did this and actually making um more realistic looking universe based on what was coming back and was in the the um the public domain it would have been great if they had just if we, they could have just been given more time and resources yeah i i, I agree with you i think uh, the writer johnny byrne did he did a lot of good research on that, you know, with really as did. much as much as he knew, as much as we knew about space back in 1975. So how successful do you think it works as an educational tool, as a way of inspiring young people about space travel and science? It was just enough to be, again, for the curious, nerdy kid, it was just enough for them to go deeper and could also serve as like a starting point in most earth science or other uh, educational programs. Because it was it was detailed just enough and it was scientifically correct enough to be interesting and to keep wanting you to go further and to expand upon those concepts. Yes. I mean, it would, and well. it would have been, I don't think they would have had enough thrust you know, in realistically, if you do what uh, the gravitational forces of a black hole is, they couldn't have, they didn't have enough thrust to get out of the damn black hole. That was, I mean, they they were reaching on that. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> and also to survive the uh, radiation from a supernova and just the heat um, and again, gravitational pull, 
those are the types of things that you would have to research to make sh- to know that that spacecraft wouldn't have been able to survive any of that. So just saying, just saying. <laughs> That's it. Sometimes dramatic contrivance, I'm exactly. afraid, has to trump. Our heroes have to survive, especially... But they especially... figured it out on the fly, even though they had this type X, Y, and Z, mm. and they made some modifications, but... Uh, again, for what it was and for them to be able to think and allow, been able to think out that loud and take that creative license. It was great for what it was. Some of it was a little funny. I was like, this little mm-hmm. kid, really? They are, yes, they are. They're just the right side. I think you, you said they are likable. They're just the right side of precocious. Precocious without, without being annoying. Mm. Not, as I said, I've said this before, they're not Wesley Crusher annoying. They just... <laughs> Not that annoying. <laughs> Poor Wesley. He is the yardstick, I'm afraid, the of uh, annoying children. So um, talk about the characters. What uh, To a British audience, there will be quite a few familiar faces in this cast. Uh, from They were quite familiar from the start of Space 1999 and also other British TV. But I imagine for you, you were coming to them fairly fresh. Um, I did, but it was refreshing learning more about them uh, from Nick Tate, um, Joanna Dunham, um, probably the only person or one of the only, it was Ed Bishop that I had some familiarity with and I didn't realize until we had started speaking. But until we took our deeper dive into um, the episode, I didn't know that Brian, Ble- is it Brian Blessed that actually had that voice of Flash? There's a lot of things that I didn't know um, about this. Again, my foray and in interest in science fiction did not come until I was an adult. And definitely the day after tomorrow, I did not know any of these people until I took a deeper dive for our episode. But I'm glad I did because I was just you know, uh, pleasantly surprised when I learned as much about all of these actors and actresses as I did. Well, I'm glad you've enjoyed that. Yeah, Brian Blessed probably has had the most sci-fi career, mm-hmm. as, as well as uh, Flash Gordon. He's in the, he does the voice of Boss Naz in the mm-hmm. um, Star Wars: The Phantom Menace. He, he, in fact, he was his. He came up with the whole sort of <laughs> sort of. Uh, Voice of eff- vocal effects, it. and and uh, to be fair, in the day after tomorrow, it's quite a restrained performance by him. It's, it's, it's kind of before he sort of really lent into the shouty persona. Mm-hmm. Uh, you mentioned um, the effects a little earlier, and I'd have to agree, I think the model effects are absolutely splendid, not only in the design and the construction of them, but the way they're filmed too. I mean, it's it's a it's a great feat, not only, especially when you have now in the age of HD, um, to be able to shoot a very, not just precise, but the detail of the modeling and a, be able to shoot it in such a manner that it doesn't look janky. You know, it looks, it's, <laughs> I wonder if they actually won awards just because of the filmography. It They shot, it was great. I thought, mm. it, I thought as I mentioned before, that elevator on the space, was great awesome on the space station was awesome pretty spectacular model that's probably the little that's probably the image that stayed with me oh we were were saying you you didn't see it as a child i have a very very dim memory think i watched it but it's the space station i remembered uh, the most and just and i remember now because i we meant at one point we had talked about um, the release of another Jedi series on Star Wars, Ahaska. Mm-hmm. And I recalled seeing that space station. There's a episode where they f- first start out a subsequent base and how well designed the day after tomorrow, that space station in comparison to 2023 and how mm-hmm. well it worked. I just, it just kind of blew me away when I made that oh. comparison. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad. So I think we should come to a a summing up, really, of 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 how we feel. Oh, I'll I'll just throw in that I love Derek Wandsworth's music as well. I think that helps a lot to give it an epic feel to it. Exactly, exactly. I mean, the music is also a part of the story. It carries it on, and I'm glad the composer actually went on to work on the second part of the series. However. The, this particular 
as for a scientific endeavor um, or educational tool, um, I think it works on so many avenues because we're talking about the beginning of the golden age of space science, um, trying to become appealing to a younger audience at a time when we were just becoming knowledgeable about space and especially deep space. So this is the type of endeavor that grabbed you and would draw you in and definitely keep um, the listening audience coming back. It wasn't so complex and the, the technical, technological fuel for curiosity. If you are curious and you want to just explore and to learn more, this was that type of creative endeavor that did wonders to do that. I compare it to some of uh, the current, what is considered sci-fi um, today, conflict-driven versus a, a story just about exploration and learning. That is what Day After Tomorrow did. And that's what kept me wanting to know more and to go back. Um, I don't need the drama, the other things, that's great, but I'm more interested in learning more about space. And as we were on the precipice, I guess Hubble and of uh, Discovery, uh, the first uh, shuttle program starting in the early 80s, all of those things we could have experienced and it would have been great to be able to incorporate all of that into this particular. And the modifications, can you imagine if they could have really <laughs> equipped it like the shuttle for deep space? Oh my God, that would have been <laughs> awesome. That would have been awesome. One little stuff I can only agree, and it's great that uh, after years of being some, something of a rarity, it's now quite easy to get hold of and to see, and I can fully recommend it. Uh, before we leave today, I'd love to hear, uh, we've been talking a lot about Deep Space and the day after tomorrow, but I want to know what's going on in the busy world of Felicia Baxter. I am trying to just stay awake long enough to use my telescope to look into space, but it doesn't help if you don't stay up past eight and you don't get up until seven. Um, I'm also wrapping up this season of my podcast, uh, Tenfro is reading as well as over 40. Um, I'm trying to pursue my other writing and literary pursuits and just getting back into travel and to being able to interact in my interpretation of what I'm seeing in the outside world. Um, and just, having fun and doing the things that I really actually like to do is what I'm going to pursue and prepare for. Um, I'm looking forward to 2024, um, but I'm going to 2023, I'm planning on doing a whole bunch more stuff just to be happy. So. Cool stuff. Well, thank you for making the time to appear on Very British Futures. Uh, and also, let's say thank you very much for you to lis for listening. Hope you've enjoyed it. And we'll all meet again soon. Bye for now. Goodbye, y'all. Thank you for having me. Very British Futures is hosted by Gareth Preston and features special guest Felicia Baxter. Music by Chattery Art. You can hear more of his work at chattryart.bandcamp.com. There are links about Felicia Baxter in the text accompanying this podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, we'd love you to rate and review it on your podcast app. Follow us on Twitter at FuturesVery. There's more information on today's episode at our website, westlakefilms.uk stroke very British Futures. And if you'd like to email us, the address is very British Futures Podcast at gmail.com. <laughs>